Check in. Are you ready yet? 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 Come on, Ben has 13 fish to talk about. We got to get it done. <laughs> uh, the word I was looking for, I was like, I'm doing my normal diva thing. <laughs> there we go. you're, you're just holding up a finger while you're texting on your phone. <laughs> It's not my fault I was late. My private jet was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that tracks. All right, we are recording in case you're wondering. Well, that's good. Well, uh, cheers to beers and whiskey. Mm-hmm. Yay. Welcome to the latest Watercolors Aquarium Gallery podcast brought to you from the Aquarium Studios in beautiful and artsy downtown Grand Rapids, <laughs> Michigan. My name is Ben. I'm Amy. And I'm Charles. Okay, I'm excited to talk about this one. We need to get into it. <laughs> So the top five list is our top five holy grail fish. That's different than favorite fish. This is a holy grail fish. This is a, a an unobtainable or at least extremely difficult to obtain or a fish that that there's this category of fish and there's this one fish in the category that's the top. Yeah, like a clear peak. Because this one was tricky for me like because i'm so spoiled like i've never had to go through that like lfs desert so like i've always been able to get pretty much whatever fish i want or there were enough here that i already wanted that i'm like you know but to me there are some categories of fish that just have like that one that's just the coolest one Uh, (laughs) the king of kings the king of kings um this one was was tricky enough that i actually went Hmm. What if I Google it? Super rare exotic aquarium fish. Um, by the way, only do that if you wish for an embarrassed laugh and are not wishing for an education. <laughs> right? So uh, the first one, 10 most exotic freshwater fish. Don't worry. I, I, I guarantee you I am not ruining it anything that are on your list, right? So that came up when I Googled um, rare fresh aquarium freshwater fish. Wait, can we take a couple guesses? Or do you need to just read them out? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll read a couple of the fun things that came okay, up okay. and then you can, you can go with some guesses, right? Um, so one of them, 10 most exotic freshwater fish, the wolf cichlid came up. Oh, why? Um, right. With minimum tank size of 75 gallons. What? Right. So wolf cichlids, I would say if we would do the top five most aggressive freshwater fish, I would say wolf cichlid, we'd drop the microphone and walk out of the room. Fair. Yeah. And it gets 14 inches long. Some people say 18 inches long. Some people say bigger than 75 gallon tank. Not a chance. Uh, and then Vampire Tetra, which, granted, that one's a little more rare, a little more exotic, but that gets almost three feet long. And they said 75 gallons. So then I gave up on that list. So then I went to, <laughs> right. So here are our 29 favorite, coolest freshwater aquarium fish that the hobby would, that any hobbyist would love in their collection. Uh, no, uh. Any hobbyist? Who is this? Any hobbyist? I don't know that I've met them. Right, not 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 my favorite hobbyist. So, two of the first three weren't terrible. They weren't good, but they weren't terrible. The first one, of course, was glowfish, which y'all know like, how I feel about. Go- they're so not rare that they're water. trademarked. Right. <laughs> <laughs> then the second one was neon tetra. Which, they're cool, they're not rare. And oh, by the way, the picture was not a picture of a neon tetra. Was it a cardinal tetra? No, it was a glow light tetra. Even so worse. it wasn't what? even like a pericardon species. Yeah. And then the third one was the golden wonder killifish. But the picture was a fundulopanchax gardener eye. Like, right. Uh, was I it would at least accept a, a gardener eye. It's not a rare killifish, but at least they're trying. Was but it at went, least a gold fundulopanchax gardener eye? No. Okay. No. But they went coolest freshwater fish, right? So I Googled rare and coolest okay, okay. came up, right? And they, they blew that one. So then um, 10 most exotic freshwater fish. That was the next link I clicked on. Exotic's another fun but, word. Oh, yeah. Guess what the first one was? Just guess. Just guess. Just guess. Exotic freshwater fish. I'll oh, tell you. No, I'll <laughs> tell you. 
<laughs> an axolotl. Oh, come on. Ouch. Anyone going, what? That's not a fish. Not a fish. Not a fish. It's an amphibian, by the way. Right. Like hardcore, not a fish. The second one. It has legs. Top 10 most exotic freshwater fish. Malawi cichlid. <laughs> I wish you could see the look on Charles's face right now. I was looking down at my notes, and then I wasn't looking down at my notes. <laughs> Which one of the over 800 species of Malawi cichlids were you uh, referring to? They almost couldn't have chosen a worse category. Right. <laughs> and the, yeah, Ex- and, and exotic. exotic. You can go into our local grocery store, and they have some Malawi cichlids. I'm not saying you should, but exotic? Come on. Oh, and number three, and the reason... So, okay, so I, a little, little funny side story on this, right? Uh, we all have... Well, some of us have printed notes. Some of, has, some of us have electronic notes. And I always put my paper upside down, and the printer prints on both sides, right? So the back side of my paper <laughs> oh, just no. had... Uh-huh. Blue lobster, right? So I flipped my paper over so Amy didn't cheat and read it. And all that's written there is blue lobster. And we're talking about our top five favorite holy grail fish. Yes. The number three most exotic aquarium, top 10 most exotic freshwater aquarium fish, according to this website, (laughs) is the blue lobster. Why do you do this to yourself? (laughs) Why do you do this to us? (laughs) For the hope of humanity, I'm just going to assume that this list was written by AI. (laughs) <laughs> this was a bot. There's a picture of the guy who uh, writes the blog. Yeah, no, he's a he's a web crawler. Yeah, I was so I'm so tempted. You know what? I don't need to call anybody out. Just Google ten exotic aquarium fish. Just Google. Actually, you get you get three different lists. Um, Google favorite coolest aquarium fish. <laughs> You're right. Why do I do this to myself? I don't. I don't know. You know we get emails know. from time to time from those link farm blogs. Really? Like asking us, "Oh, will you link this to our page or whatever? We've got this information here, and it is. It's always like some just generic nonsense like that. Like, could you just have paid like the 16 year old kid at your local chain pet store to write it instead? That would be better. They would know better. This this misinformation that's out there. It's like misinformation is a thing. Gross. Gross. Mm-hmm. What were some of your guesses going to be? Well, usually when people are thinking of like rare, exotic, holy grail fish, they're just thinking about like really unique versions of things they already understand, like flower horns or super red bristlenose placos or stuff right. like that. If it was written by like an average entry level hobbyist, that's kind of what I would be looking at. But those things aren't rare. They're no. just no. sometimes a little difficult to find. Some fish that I'm staying away from, and if they're on your lists, that's fine. But I'm staying away from things that would be on our top 10 aquarium fish that don't belong in the hobby, like the Asian arowana. I know to many that is a holy grail fish. That is an ultimate fish. For one thing, it's illegal to import in the United States. Yeah. Um, but it's also yes. I did not put snakeheads on my list right. this time. I did not put flower horns because I don't like them. Um, the most expensive freshwater fish ever sold was a koi, right? Exotic Holy Grail expense has a lot to do with that. Koi are definitely exotic, definitely Holy Grail. There are some Holy Grail kois, but they don't belong in aquariums. Big ponds, great. Mm -hmm. Aquariums, no. And I also didn't put any of the really fancy type goldfish on there. But that was kind of how I limited my list. How about you guys? What were some of your qualifiers? My main qualifier was I was trying to think of groups of fish I really like mm-hmm. and think of fish that are just like kind of like outstanding members of their society. That was, yeah. But like, yeah. I also had the like self imposition of like, but this individual also had to have like an expense that was significantly more so than the average expense or attainability. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I, I wanted I like a it. combination of the two. Okay. Yeah. I like it. Mine kind of all sit in that. Like if I was looking at a list to order, mm-hmm. I'd be like, Oh man, somebody's going to be so excited about that, Ugh, but they're not going to want to pay for it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's, that about qualifies it. All right. Cool. Yeah. 
so should I get started with probably the one that almost everybody knows is going to be on this list? I, I wonder if you even know which one I'm talking about. When I say it, you'll probably know. Hold on, I got to flip my paper so I can get ready to scratch out the... <laughs> I'm going to start with the classic L46 Zebra Pleco. Hype in Sistress Zebra. That's the sound of me scratching out the L46 off my list. Absolutely. We've talked about this pretty recently, but I just want to reiterate that this is a fish that is two inches long that you're never going to see. Almost never. And I still think it's not overhyped. It's not overrated and it's not overpriced. I, I disagree with none of your statements. <laughs> it just, it is what it says on the tin. It's an amazing fish that nothing else looks like. It so belongs as the first fish we talk about for holy grail fish. Mm -hmm. It is for many and for good reason, the ultimate holy grail fish. Yeah. And I've nothing to say against that. Yeah. Um, one of some of the things that make this holy grail fish First of all, look at it. Yeah. Right. It's incredible looking. Um, but the second of all, it is it is most likely extinct in the wild. So the story with the L46 and, and, and a lot of the reason this fish is so extremely expensive is um, it comes from or it originally came from one small section of one river in South America. And somewhere in the like 2005 i believe it was that sounds right some company paid off somebody in the brazilian government to allow a dam to be put on the one stretch of river this pleco was found so this is a shallow water fast water plecostomus predatory it, predatory like, it's just that weird little niche fish yeah. in all those ways it's a carnivore yeah river fish don't do well in most lakes <laughs> what right no, that's a different environment they don't do well in deep water they don't do well in slow water mm. so i don't know about expeditions to go there and see if they found them near the spot where those dams are as far as i know that has not happened I, um, i'm guessing that the habitat that they were like they evolved from just doesn't exist anymore. Like probably big right. thickets of like brush that touch the bottom with a ton, whole ton of little microorganisms in it. And water that flows past it. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. like that all had to have just gone away. Flooded. Yeah. It's now under a hundred feet of water. They're gone. Fortunately, there are a number of breeders in the United States that are dedicated to the pre preservation of this fish. So it is available. But when you go into a store and you see that $250, $300 price tag on that fish, that's why. Yeah, there are a couple of things on my list that I say, if you're keeping it, you should be breeding it. Um, this I don't think is one of them because they are actually available, but they have pretty small brood sizes. So, and nobody really wants to pay for them. So you're not going to see them very often. Yeah. They're, yeah. And they're, they're not an easy breeder. They yeah. are no. breedable, but they're not an easy one. And not on a commercial scale. Like you're going to get it from somebody in your aquarium club. You're mm -hmm. not going to get it from like probably a chain store. Or, nope. Like well, this is all a fancy way of them dancing around saying if someone could get rich off of these things, it would have happened already. Right. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, we have had them. Mm -hmm. Um, we every once in a while can still get them and we will when we see them again. Yeah, totally. Absolutely hitting it out of the park with the kickoff uh, holy grail fish. That is not just what I would say is the holy grail pleco for most pleco keepers, but for even for non pleco keepers that are just into cool fish, it's a holy grail fish. Yeah. For sure. I, as soon as this idea popped into our heads, I thought, what is Charles going to do with this one? Uh oh. <laughs> so what's your first one i'm gonna start off with one that i actually hesitated to put on this list because i already gave my criteria yeah honestly have no idea how much this fish would cost because i have never seen it oh Ooh. so that's yeah. where charles is gonna go with it <laughs> yeah <laughs> so epistogramma agazizii collection location koipia oh so you're talking about an episto that if you want it 
you would have to go to the Amazon River system. Or is, fi- it, is it Brazilian? No, I think it's actually, um, what's, I think it's Colombian or Peruvian. I can't remember. It's, oh. but West Coast. If it's Colombian or Peruvian, then it's attainable. Yeah. But um, I think you have to find someone who's like went and collected them and is breeding them because I think they come from a, a specific region that people doing these things don't normally get to. Right. Some of those regions in either Peru or Colombia that... So there's a whole section. Somebody was, was uh, explaining to me some of the politics in Peru. And there's like this whole strip between Brazil and the coast that uh, is controlled by people doing things that they don't want other people to know about. Mm. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's not safe there. And it's a, it's a substantial section of it. You don't just get to go out and wave your fishnet and be like, I don't see anything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then in Colombia, uh, just recently, the, what, what's the, the revolution that was been happening there for like 30, for the FARC? I don't, I'm terrible. I with believe that that's, sort of thing. I, I cannot remember the names of that. I know, I know the conflict you're talking about, yeah, but I don't it, remember the name. Historic peace happened there and some people are, are, are really not happy about it because both parties did really terrible things to each other during, you know, a war. And so the, now they're trying to get each side to forgive each other. And some of it is, is the, uh, the Colombian government trying to say to these warlords, put down your weapons and we'll accept you in. And the people going, but wait, that particular warlord ordered a hit on my family. Um, <laughs> but it's the only way that peace could ever possibly happen in a war that's been going on for 30 or 40 years. Wait, you mean to tell me that no one can fight a war without doing some awful things? Yeah. But what's happening as a result, wh- why does this matter to us Aquarian people, right? What's happening is there's there's peace happening in some of those regions, and that's allowing ecotourism and some collection of aquarium fish to happen. So we have yeah. seen some pretty cool stuff come in lately. So I'm going to spell out the name of the collection location so anyone listening can, you know, look it up and be like, oh, that is a pretty cool thing. <laughs> Epistogramma, Agazizii. And then I don't speak Portuguese or any, like, South American language, so I'm just guessing on the pronunciation of uh, Koi Pia. But it's a uh, C U I P E U A. Koi P U A? I don't know. Yep, not sure. Yeah, there you go. That's actually probably one of the First Nation people names, not a uh, Portuguese or Spanish name. Entirely which would possible. make it even harder. <laughs> For me, anyways, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, Latin is really a lot easier. What <laughs> differentiates that fish from the other Agassizii populations? Can you look it up real quick oh, yeah, for yeah. me, Amy, with your laptop? Like, just I show them, know when you first started talking about it. Just show them a picture. Like, there. That's what you need to know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you know what kind of water they're found in? Uh, typical Peruvian, like uh, that part of the world, slightly soft. I think like six point five pH is typical for them. I need you to spell it again because I wasn't listening to you. <laughs> C U I P E U A. Ha. Ha. It's that one. I have seen pictures of that fish before. And it's the that one. It, yeah. That's a naturally coloring oh, wow. color variation. There's some really cool aquarium strains coming out of some of the episto populations that almost look as cool as that. Almost. Yeah, yeah. almost. <laughs> almost as in maybe a little more than half. <laughs> you know, I, yeah, I didn't, I put an Episto on my list, but I might scratch it out because you put a better Holy Grail Episto. Yeah, than... I tried to put an Episto and there are so, it's kind of like I tried to put a, we were talking about Cory Doris earlier today. It's so diverse and so many of them are just as cool that it was really hard for me to be like, no, that's the one. Because then I was like. You did put one Cory on though, right? Huh? You did put one Cory on though, didn't you? On my list? No, yeah. I didn't. You didn't? Mm-mm. Dang it. I didn't because I thought you were going to put it on there. No, I didn't. I got you. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a specific one. Anyway, back to the, the Episto I guess easy. Yeah. Other than that, it should be a normal Episto, right? Yeah. My understanding is it's not complicated. It doesn't have anything weird. It's just a different stream. It is an absolutely incredible color variation. <laughs> it's just a lot harder to stand out in the honors class. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
That's a good one. So uh, I'm going to start out with what, of course, I'm sure you all assumed would be my obvious choice mm-hmm. for a holy grail fish. I, I'm guessing you guys know exactly which better. What, which I'm, better you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to me, indubitably, better macrostoma, the king of bettas. Yeah. The Brunei beauty. Yeah. Yep. It is uh, an ultimate holy grail. It's one that I've actually kept on a couple of different occasions. Um, we have some, Amy actually has some pretty incredible footage of uh, a male and female trying to decide who's boss. By the way, the female was definitely the boss in that <laughs> video. <laughs> Honestly, they would do, they would spar so often like that, but I have a few good videos. I think there's one of two males on our YouTube channel, but I've got to find the good female one too. Yeah. Yeah. I might have it somewhere too. We'll have to get that. Look for that being posted on our YouTube channel because there's some pretty incredible videos there. The personality of this fish to me is like almost as impressive as its looks. It's just an absolutely fearless little fish. They're so cool. The videos of people uh, snorkeling with them in the wild, Mm -hmm. they're just as fearless in the wild. Like, Like, what is this giant thing? Yeah, and they come all truck and go, what? You messed our territory. I got my eye on you. I'm watching you. Yeah, yeah, I think their only amazing. natural predators come from outside the water. Right. Yeah, they, there's no aquatic predators there for them. Like, Birds they're are there. almost the only thing that lives there. They're definitely the biggest yeah. fish in those streams. Yeah. Right. So why are these fish expensive? They are found in just a very few mountain streams in Borneo. And to get there, it's something like a three or six day hike. And you have to get permission from the, was it a sultan? I believe it's a sultan. sultan. Yes. Um, And sometimes um, when you get back with the fish, he has changed his mind. Um, It's one of the few absolute monarchies left on the planet. Oh, yes. Yes, it is. Yes. Um, The the sultan has ultimate power and his rule is law. Um, Some of the things I've heard about him is he's not a, a terrible ruler just a little unpredictable at times. But anyway, back to the better. Um, a 20 long is big enough for this fish, even though it gets almost five inches. Um, they can do just fine in a tank that size. You do have to be careful with males and females together because they don't always agree on when what should happen. Yeah. Ours we found pretty easy to feed. Um, Anything that can fit in their mouth. Yeah, they will. And when breeding isn't involved, they're shockingly not that aggressive. Right. Like we introduced it to that shy little peppermint pikehead and she didn't even care. Yeah. But, well, the peppermint pikehead hardly looks like a fish. So she probably didn't recognize <laughs> the fish. Oh, like if anything's going to look, if anyone's going to think that that fish looks similar to them, I would think a big bat would probably be about the closest. Yeah, that's true. Both anabantoids and hmm. yeah. yeah, that's a good thought. Um, they are a paternal mouth brooder, and we tried really hard to make that happen here. It did not. Maybe someday. It's definitely still on my list of, of yeah. something to attempt. It was a wrong place, wrong time kind of situation where we just didn't have the energy to spend on it at the right. time. What do you think, Charles? Are we ready for another one? Uh... I have a very different opinion of macrostoma than everyone at the table, and I've been quiet just because I'm like, this is a discussion on why they're cool, not why I don't like them mm. personally. <laughs> so that's for another day. But what I do want to mention is, uh, as long as we're talking about why they're cool, yeah, <laughs> evolutionarily, they're the most basal living branch of the beta genetically. So they separated out first. Pretty much. Of the living lineages, yes. Yeah. Fascinating. Yep. That makes sense to me when you take into context where they're from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very isolated population. But the thing is, we're doing Blackwater now. So some of the issues that we were having with them shouldn't be as extreme. That is true. Yeah, that was one of our big struggles is that that male kept getting a bacterial infection and we could not get it to go away. Well, and well, and the other struggle we've had, at least with the most recent pair, was the compatibility. And I'm given that the advice I've been given is larger groups. And that is intimidating to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that works with um, um, Ocelata and Unimacagata. Yeah. Larger groups. 
Although with the Unimaculata, if I, well, my experience with the Unimaculata, at least from the collection location we were working with, was that they behaved very dissimilar from the literature, at least with pairing wise. And I'll get into that in a later thing. That's not for this, but that's just me commenting on like, I think people need to appreciate how behaviorally diverse bettas are in general, <laughs> right. because like people have just been broad stroking the entire Unimaculata complex and expecting them to behave the same. And my experience thus far has been, they do not. Yeah. And uh, fun fact, genetically, the macrostoma is not in the Unimaculata complex. It's its own thing. It used to be. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's isolated now. Well, I mean, talking like clade versus complex. It was in its own complex. Or it was in it was in the complex with Ocelata and Unimaculata, mm-hmm. and now it's separ- it's out of that complex and in its own clade because of genetic data. Yeah. but a lot of that a lot of the hobby hasn't caught up with that yet. Right, because you know <laughs> we're a little behind. <laughs> <laughs> That's all science, and well, yeah, well, great choice. It's hard to argue against that one. Thanks. I know I had to have it in. Got to scratch it out now. <laughs> all right, Amy. All right, should I do my cheat? Or should I just do a regular one again? You do, a cheat. do like two <laughs> cheats. So, uh, okay. But see, you got to hear me out on this one. Cause this is a real cheat. Okay. But there's no way that you guys are going to let me do a top five. Holy grail invertebrate episode. So I got to <laughs> sneak it in there. <laughs> what are you, but, this guy that's like blue lobster and axolotls? <laughs> Jeez. So we have to, we have to edit the, the podcast and say top five aquarium inhabitants. <laughs> nah, we'll still say fish. I'll, okay. I'll just break the rules. All right. But I went with Caradina Dennerly, which is the Su- Suluisi cardinal shrimp. Oh yeah. So these are the ones that are a really rich red body with white legs, white antennae and white polka dots on them. They're and they're really a little funky. bit smaller than cherry shrimp. They're really funky looking. And the best thing about them is they come from hard water. We need them. Water harder than ours. We need lots of them. Sulawesi is an amazing little, like, I don't know, like oasis for invertebrates. There's lots of funky things that come out of Sulawesi. A couple of cool lakes in that area that that just breed some really crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. That's where rabbit snails come from. Oh, yeah. So uh, we've had them once. Um, I took a couple of them home and treated them like cherry shrimp or I put them in the tank. I was breeding cherry shrimp in, which was like really driftwood heavy, really like it was actually a soft water tank and they did not, they survived just fine, but they never bred for me. Now I'm really looking forward to trying them again at some point. What happened to the ones you had? They just sort of aged out. I think. Okay. Um, I had them in there. Like, I think I had three of them and they were in there for over a year and they're smaller than cherries. So they're I don't think they live that long. Right. Yeah. Oh, they were, they were really awesome when they were in there because they have white legs. So you can actually see them grazing really, really clearly. Oh, that's cool. So you see them picking up they They basically are teeny tiny, um, blood shrimp, like the ones from saltwater tanks. Right. Yeah. Liz Mata de Bilius. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. That's on my, that's on my personal Holy Grail list. Which How big of a tank would you need? A gallon? That's it. How often do we see them? I've seen them once on our list. Once. Okay. Yeah, if I saw them again, I would definitely order them again. Okay. But they're pretty well available from um, like Aquabid or from private sellers like that. Because um, the people who keep them breed them pretty well. But it's not an area that is probably a good idea to be collecting heavily out of. So they don't show up very often. And they're really only a few specialty shrimp breeders that have them. Um, but we're a little bit more advantaged towards breeding them here. True. We need them. Yes. All right. I'll start working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I might even just ask our wholesaler. Sometimes they'll find something like that for us. That's true. Yeah. Shoot them an email. That's a good idea. I like it. Cool. All right, I got my cheat out of the way. Now I'm going to play it straight the rest of the match. I I'm doubt it. Now, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to hold off on uh, any bettas just because I can. Right. <laughs> but I did put down Apsarius Pulcellus. Mm, good choice. I'm glad somebody did. Um, man, there's just so much to like about this fish. This is one of the few fish I've ever seen in a tank 
that behaves like a true schooling fish. True. I'm so used to being like a fish being billed as a schooling fish and then you get it and you watch it and it's a showling fish. Yes, it's different. <laughs> yeah, like even your average Danny, okay, yeah, they'll do some schooling behavior, but really they're just all dashing around at the same time. Right. And they'll group up if they feel threatened. Mm-hmm. Like even the Antetras will group up if they feel threatened, but in your tank they shouldn't feel threatened. These yeah. guys just... Group up. Do it. They are, I would say that they're like Giant Daniels plus. Giant Daniels with a cooler paint job. Cooler paint job, much higher activity level. So I would give them a much like, I would be comfortable if someone's like, oh, I want to keep like Giant Daniels in like a 40 breeder. I would be a little uh, with these guys in there. I think you need something four feet long. (laughs) Four feet at least. They're 100 gallons right now and they're, they, they still feel, feel a little crowded. Yeah. yeah. And uh, when Nick did like a 40% water change on that tank the other day, and they were surging afterward, like going up at the current all together, like the way that you would see river fish like dashing up the river because I think they thought, well, it's it's high water time. It's we're going to go, go upstream. Oh, that was so cool. That's, That's awesome. not a behavior that you see in aquariums very often. Right. They apparently like fill a very similar ecological niche as like small trouts would in North America. Yeah. Yeah. They live in those fast flowing, slightly cooler streams with the pebbly bottoms. So they want that flow. They want the clear, clean water. They want uh, yada, yada, yada. Northern India, right? Uh, no, I actually think that they're closer to Vietnam. Oh, Central and Western Thailand. Oh, there we go. I was way off. Yeah. It's, um, it's basically the Mekong Basin. Okay. Which I think, like... The river itself goes into India, doesn't it? Like, it's a long one? I don't think so. You got Bangladesh in between India Mm. and Southeast Asia. So this is why this is such a weird fish to me. So the Mekong River Basin is one of the most heavily collected from rivers, like, basins in Mm -hmm. the entire world for the aquarium hobby. And they're still a rarity. And from all the literature I can find, they're super common. Aren't they just like further upstream? No, they just don't get collected. I mean, yes, really? but they just don't get collected. Huh. Like they are readily accessible as near as I can tell. They just don't, they're not considered desirable. Wow. They're cool. Yeah. <clears throat> they're a favorite for me. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, it is kind of like the tank that you would keep one in is a rarity or a group in. Just because, like, if people are keeping a big tank, they're usually not keeping a big school of smaller fish. They often start, well, yeah, I can get big cichlids and I can get this and that, rather than just kind of scaling up their smaller tank into something bigger. True. I don't know. But it like, al- also would be a difficult fish to keep in, like, small groups or pairs. Right. I don't know that they would they no. would make it. And it's not an inexpensive fish. And so you do need a bigger tank with one main kind of fish in it. Although the dwarf pikes that are schooling with them are yeah. really sweet. Mm-hmm. So imagine like a hillstream tank mm-hmm. with Apsarius canyos. You can, let's, I'm not saying this is a biotope. It's very clearly not. A pair of dwarf pikes mm-hmm. and a, just a smoke load of hillstream loaches. Yeah, that would be very on. cool. That it would be cool. That would be very cool. It would be beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would work. There would be so much activity in that tank. There'd be so much color. Right. Feeding time would be insane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's the thing with these guys. What do they eat? Um, whatever you put in the tank. Yeah. And as much as possible. Yeah. They're very aggressive about it, too. Um, I once had to, like, like slap one back in because it came up at the surface so fast that it literally jumped out. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and if we don't feed them aggressively, they will start to starve because of how active they are. Yeah. That metabolism has got to just be going yeah. through the food. It's insane. Yeah. But they're cool. Yeah. I really like them. Yeah. That's a good choice. I'm so glad that we have them. Like I just, it's a fish that I never think that I could devote a tank to, but I'm really glad we do that here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. I agree. <clears throat> so, um, one of the fish that I think 
it, it, it is is the definition of a holy grail fish. And and you know when we talked about it, it was here's this group of fish that we keep a lot of, but then here's this one that just stands out. And the group of fish I'm talking about is pencil fish, and it's a group of just amazing, amazing fish. Um, the 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 two red ones, the coral red and the purple pencil fish, um, Morton Thel or I and Ruba Pinnis, those guys are just exceptionally colorful, gorgeous fish. Mm-hmm. Some of the um, um, smaller, let's call them browner ones, but they're long and skinny. The, um, the equis, equis, the Beckford, yes. the um, trifasciata. They are so cool. Most They need to mimic wood. Yeah, I could see even the red like the two red species being on this list for some spe- for some people. They would be close if there wasn't one that was a step above. Mm-hmm. Yep. And way less available. Right. And that is Nanostomus spi, the espy pencil fish. It is found in a very small river system in Guyana. It's endemic to that river system, and that's why we don't see it. I'm so glad you put these on there, because I did... They got bumped off of mine. Did they really? Mm-hmm. I don't know how they could have poss- possibly well, gotten bumped. What do you want to see what I'm going to talk about? Uh, I've been hearing <laughs> you already. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so the Mazaruni River System in Guyana, is their, uh, that's their home turf, and that's the only place that they're found. And it's, from my understanding, is they're, they're fairly common in that river system, but Guyana is just not a place where a lot of collection happening happens. Um, and so that's what makes them really rare in the hobby. Oh, Many pencil fish are in the five to ten dollar range. The purple and red ones are more like in the fifteen dollar range. These guys, if we get them, they're going to be in the thirty dollar range. Which, you know, there are definitely more expensive fish that are on our holy grail list, but these, I think, they fit it because yeah. of oh, for sure. the group of fish that they're in and the effect that they create in a tank is pretty stunning. Yeah. Yeah, they have these really cool, they're not quite vertical. They're like, they're not quite diagonal. They're like, what would be a 22 and a half degree angle? Yeah. Like just slightly off of vertical barring on them. And it fits the orientation. You know, a lot of the pencil fish sit at a slight angle in the water. These guys sit at a slight angle and it makes their bar straight up and down. Yeah, I could so see how in an area with like floating brush, how you they would be completely invisible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But like as the perfect like contrasting accent to some really nice epistos. Oh man, that would be such an elegant look. They would be perfect. If we could get them, we would have them all the time. Mm-hmm. Yep. They're amazing. Have you seen them before Charles? Were you around when we, we had them in? Nope. We've had them in one time, I think. Yeah. In six years. Yeah. And that they was, did fine. That was pre me. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, they should be just as hardy as all of the other pencils, um, as long as they come in in good condition. Um, Listen, if they but, were in at that time and I could keep them alive, then they were probably pretty good, pretty yeah, solid. for sure. <laughs> for sure. Great yeah. choice. Thanks. Is it really my turn again? It came around to you really quickly, Amy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm going to talk about... The shoot to deny puffer. I'm so glad you brought that one up. <laughs> did that one get bumped off your list? It did. Wait, what puffer? The shoot to deny, which is the spotted Congo puffer. I have no idea what that is. No, <laughs> it's basically the holy grail puffer. Yeah. This species was actually fairly common in the 60s, but due to where it's collected, mm, now right. is not really available anymore. Um, it is a Congo River Basin species. It comes from sort of the mouth of the river where it widens into almost a lake. Um, but these are probably one of the most attractive looking puffers out there. Mm-hmm. They only get about four inches. If in a carefully planned tank, you can keep a group of them fairly easily. And you can keep them with some other fish as long as they can't eat them. They're surprisingly peaceful, right? Yeah. So it has... Basically, all of the things that you'd want out of a puffer without really any of the negatives. Right. It's not going to break your tank. It's not going to kill all your fish. You don't have to keep it alone in a tank where you can't even see it. Um, 
there's never going to be that puffer that everybody's looking for that's not a puffer anymore. Yeah, I want 20 of them in a group that all live together and are friends. And I can keep them with my neon Tetras. Right. Like, no, I'm sorry. Don't get a puffer. <laughs> but if you're looking for that puffer, this is probably the one. They are actually fairly available, but they still are over $200 each. So, holy grail, yes. Hopefully we'll see some more peace in the region and we'll be able to see them in stores and actually sell them too. So a group of five? Yeah, I yeah. think a group of five, yeah. maybe in like a 55 gallon at, tank. At 250 a piece? Yeah. Perfect. Um, they do like to bite plants. <laughs> like I don't even want to say they eat them, but they, they will tear up plants if you have them in there. So some good... I, a, maybe an African biotope with Anubius, Bulbitis, some really hard plants. You'll still see some little piter, puffer bite marks little out chunks. of them, but <laughs> yeah, whatever. The yeah. tanks for the puffers, not for the plants. Mm -hmm, but you yeah. gotta have plants. Yeah. Those, <laughs> I see those on the list every once in a while and I get tempted and I look at that price tag and just go... Yeah, one of the way I made this list is I dug through like the dusty shameful part of our order boards <laughs> of things that like we couldn't fill for people or things that people ordered and then backed off of. So this is one of them. The zebra pleco was a one was one of them. Right. And I think both of my others were from on that list too of either uh, the order sort of timed out because we couldn't fill it or somebody really like their eyes were bigger than their stomach on right. it. This guy thankfully at least told us, uh, no, actually, I can't afford a $250 puffer right now. <laughs> I do remember that we, I think we're still sitting on one of those fish that we ordered for somebody that. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember what it is, but. It I'll happens it. from time to time. It does. And I don't like, I don't like pulling those off of the list. So they just kind of sink to the bottom and then I scroll back and feel bad every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. True story. Charles. Got a Congo fish too. Yeah? Yeah. Land by Congo Tetras. Wait. Mm. I got to scratch that off. <sighs> yeah, there's Congo Tetras and then there's Land by Congo Tetras. Yeah. I, I don't have a lot to say about it. I just, it's one of those fish that I'm like, I wish more people wanted to try and get into because I, like, I imagine that they can't be much more different to breed than. Congo tetras other than you know they're wild <laughs> right but right. the literature is out there people have done it and it's a fish that i think could become far more attainable but no one's just working with them so they're just not and i'm like well why because <laughs> right now they're 40 dollar a piece fish yeah yeah for a tetra and really you should have five of them yeah when? And it's true. I mean, that's that's why this list is there. There's good reasons for the fish being that that expensive. Um, the stability in the Congo, you know, who knows how long that's going to last. It's already a little gotten a little bit shaky again. I just would be sad if things changed where they come from and then they're just gone from the hobby forever. Yeah, or change where they come from and they're just gone from the earth forever that's exactly. a possibility as well that's not outside the realm of possibility this is just one of those fish that i'm like we we can we very clearly have the ability to people are doing it just not in the quantities that they should be right right agreed um a 40 gallon breeder with a group of five or six. Oh yeah perfect I actually loved the way that they paired with the uh, standard Congo Tetra. They looked really good yeah. with I don't, them. I don't know that that would be an appropriate breeding group, but behaviorally, the the domesticated Congo Tetra is like, they, they come out of their shells way faster and they bring the other fish out too. I wonder if they could hybridize. I, I just, because if they couldn't, that could be a, a decent dither. It'd be, it'd be a shame to find out the hard way. they could. Yeah, I don't know. Fish are really crazy in their ability to hybridize. Right, right. But I bet you could also keep them with, like, larger South American tetras or something like that that might be a little bit, like, genetically yeah, that's more true. distanced. That's true. Maybe silver hatchets. Oh, yeah, that would be cool. Something that doesn't look camouflaged so that it looks like they're trying to be out there and be bold. Yeah. yeah. I feel like the hatchets would be, like, a good accent, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that'd be a cool tank. Pretty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
maybe even just giant Daniels. I mean, if the goal yeah. is you want to get these things to breed. Or even like like leopard Daniels or something too. Because they don't need to yeah, be huge. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Right. We had them overlapping with those panda barbs for a while and that seemed to be fine. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but barbs are aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but barbs do not know how to mind their uh, personal space. I mean, they're not much better than Daniels. No, they're <laughs> yeah. not. <laughs> Basically the same thing. Yeah, I don't know. It's just one of those fish that it's like, man, we used to literally not be able to get them at all, and now they're here, and I just feel like... <laughs> this is going to sound so judgy. I feel like people aren't appreciating enough what that what's... Like, we yeah. have things available to us now that, like, four years ago was a pipe dream six years ago we didn't even know they existed exactly yeah Yeah. and so i'm like i just want to get that name out there yeah (laughs) yeah point is they're not new to science they exist they have been out there we just haven't been able to get them and now we can and that is a privilege so that is privilege we should don't squander it i'm glad Uh we have them (laughs) cool (laughs) excellent what do you got ben well Hmm. How many have we each done? Three. So I two more. All right. I'm going to go with... Uh, well, we've done three. You've done two. So this is my third. So I got two. Yeah. two. All right. I'm going to go with uh, what is very much uh, my... Would this be my ultimate... Like on this list, I'd get one fish. I think it would be this one, not Betamecostoma. Only because I had better macrostoma, although I've had these guys too, just not nearly as successfully. Uh, Ultim angels. Hmm. I was hoping you were going to bring those up too. So that's Terraphylum ultim. At first glance, they really look like a wild type Terraphylum scalar, which mm-hmm. is the classic angelfish. Um, but there's something about the ultims. Yeah, like you could look at a picture and be like, "Yeah, but I could spend a." Th- a quarter of the money and get a silver angel or a 10th. Yeah. <laughs> and they would or, live. Yeah. Sorry. A quarter <laughs> of the money and get a adult breeding pair of silver angel fish for the same price or for a quarter of the price of the smallest ultimate angel literally possible. <laughs> yeah. That's probably true. Um, there's two strains, the Rio Orinoco and the Rio Atabapo, but they're found in both the Atabapo strain. Um, an adult, Adabapo strain, Ultim Angel, top to bottom can reach 20 inches. So the, and, and the body size is going to be similar to the body size of an adult normal angelfish. But the fin extensions on those things get so long that the elegance of that fish is just unbeatable. Mm-hmm. And then they get blues and reds. At first glance, it looks like dark brown, black stripe, Look closer, and there's blue, and there's red in that stripe, and they are stunning, majestic angels. Yeah, and that elegance, it does come across in pictures, because it is part of how they look, but it's also the way they move. Right. That, the way that those fins gracefully drape, and they use to orient their body, and they almost school together. Yeah, they, they will form some amazing groups. Um Jeff Sensky of the Aquarium Design Group. I know he had it for a while. I don't know if he still does. He had one of the most incredible Ultim Angel displays that I've ever seen. I think it's like a 120. When you look at the picture, it looks like it's a 40-gallon tank. I actually called him about the tank and, and, and asked him to describe it. And the scale is completely thrown off because of how huge these angelfish are. They're absolutely incredible. I learned a fascinating thing about one of the reasons they're so delicate. They come from um, low pH tannic water, right? And they, they do have the potential to have that pH and hardness brought up and have them survive and be fine. But what happens is because they're a bigger fish and they're a little on the sensitive side, uh, they're caught in some of the upper regions of these rivers. And then on the boat, they get trucked all the way down the river and the people on the boat have a flow through system into their holding tanks to keep nice, good, fresh, clean water flowing over the fish. It's a cool idea. Except 
if you go from black water to what they call in South America, white water. And the black water has a pH of around 5 to 5.5, sometimes up to 6. The white water has a pH of 7.5. 2 to 7.5. Listen to our acclimation episode if you want to learn why that's spooky. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and so that just does damage to the fish that's irreparable. So when they get to the United States, they're in very, very difficult, very poor conditions. Yeah. After probably being on a plane twice and not eating for a couple of days yeah. and et cetera, et cetera, yep. et cetera. So they come in really rough. For a while, there was a guy out of Chicago that was bringing them in as juveniles and spending six, eight, nine months with them and then selling them. And those fish were incredible. They were perfect. There was, we had zero, we got one batch from that guy and we had zero losses with Ultim Angels. It mm-hmm. was unbelievable. They Every other time food. I've tried them. Yeah. They, they acted like angelfish. Mm-hmm. Yep. Every other time I've tried them, I just slowly watched my heart break. So somebody condition Ultimate Angels for nine months and then sell them to us, okay? Yeah, yeah, we'll buy them. And the other thing is I wonder what his like success rate percentage was too. 60. 60? Yep. That's actually way better than I would have thought. Yeah. And that's still kind of depressing. Mm-hmm. Hmm. They're amazing fish. We need to figure out how to get them in the hobby. I know a couple of people that have been trying to breed them. Um, there is somebody out of Germany that's had some success with it. I don't know anybody in the States who's had success. I know some people that have actually gotten eggs and couldn't raise the eggs. And um, Although, don't get depressed. Read some of the um, discus literature from the 60s and 70s. Shoot, read some of the angelfish terrifying scalar literature yeah. from the 30s and 40s. I think um, maybe it's time that we buy the uh, angelfish version of the better book that Charles has. Yeah, that might be fun to have. Because he does have a guide in there on breeding. On breeding altums? Oh, and that's Hans. It's, um, what is it, Linky? Horse Linky. Yeah. Horse Linky. I had that moment of, oh, we're talking the same guy. Oh, yeah. I know what's Horse happening. Linky. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't he German? Uh, I think he's Dutch. Dutch. Okay. I wonder if he's the guy who's breeding him. Could be. Could be. Great choice. Thanks. Had to include it. All right. So you guys know that I've been kind of obsessed with the little uh, slime-eating little loaches lately. (laughs) (laughs) You like those little slimy guys. (laughs) So I wanted to talk about, I love Hillstream loaches. This is going to be the holy grail Hillstream loach, the panda loach. They're so cute. They're really, really cute. Get like two inches long um that really really striking black and white striping is their juvenile form um so that's really what they're known for but they do age into a really beautiful mottled fish these things are pretty much impossible to get um they are on the dusty sad list of people who have asked us for them and we have not seen them they come from like two tiny hill streams up in the mountains in asia um, so they're really difficult to import and they're really prone to like the concept of being over harvested too. So this is one of those that on my list that I'm like, if you're doing them, you should be breeding them. There are so few breeding reports of this fish, but from what I can tell, it has absolutely nothing to do with how difficult they are to breed. Really? I, I've heard a couple of the, like the few people who have bred them and it's only a handful I've seen people breed them in like that. Well, yeah, I was holding them in a tank and one popped up like that's the funnest with other fish. So I wonder if it's just that people are only getting the juveniles and maybe not raising them up long enough and not enough are being imported to actually have like a hobby pool of fish to breed. Um, I think there's like one or two people in the U S that have done it and a handful maybe in Europe, but this, that's, that's what makes it a Holy grail. There's always some interesting discussion that happens around aquarium clubs with breeding because the, the aquarium club model is often based around how many different kinds of fish can I breed? Mm -hmm. And, there's been a couple of attempts to try and 
not reverse that trend, but maybe make that trend go in two different directions instead of just that direction. And instead of how many different kinds of fish can I breed, how long can I maintain a breeding population of one kind of fish? Mm-hmm. A species, species maintenance program is one of the the classic examples of, of what's used in that. And the value in that for fish like this, and actually one of the fish on my list too, um, it's huge. Yeah. If you can keep something around for a long time, we can keep it in the hobby. White cloud mountain minnows and red tail sharks are the two classic examples of really, really popular fish that don't exist in the wild anymore. Well, and that's the thing. Like, it's really easy when you hear something like that. Like, oh, yeah, well, if everybody who wanted them got them, then there wouldn't be any left in the wild. Because that's the truth. It is true. But. The other side of that coin, it's kind of a double-edged sword, is if nobody can get them, that habitat is still equally threatened. True. And it's threatened in a way that means we won't have them anymore. They will cease to exist completely. So we got to toe that line of collecting enough that we can keep them in existence and making sure that there's still enough to actually inhabit the waters that they come from. Um, But, you know, that's not necessarily what I'm here for today what i'm here for today is i really really want these fish (laughs) (laughs) you're allowed to tout the line of sustainability amy i mean that that's uh, you know i I think when we're talking about holy grail fish we're talking about fish that are expensive for a reason and i don't know that you can't have that conversation without also talking about sustainability right the 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 better macrostoma Mm -hmm. is expensive because it's also rare and in a delicate ecosystem in the wild yeah and it that one is attainable because there are a few people who have chosen to make that their mission right right if we could figure out sustainable collection we'd have the fish we want and they'd be okay in the wild i just realized that like part of what makes this fish so endearing to me is that it really has pretty much the same look and body shape as a baby epaulet shark (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and they kind of like waddle around like a baby epaulet shark some of those some of those hillstream loaches have that shark ray look in a pretty mm-hmm. big way everyone yeah. who's listening to the podcast right now i'm gonna want you to pause it i want you to pull up a tab for youtube and type unless in, you're driving unless right. you're driving i want you to pull up a tab that says tennessee aquarium baby epaulet sharks yes yeah you'll Perfect. think this later Yo, yep yep you, you need that in your life yes for sure Everyone needs an epaulet shark in their life. We need an epaulet shark, guys. They're so cute. I know. I love them. They're the best. <sighs> anyway, loaches. <laughs> Panda loaches. Good choice. I actually couldn't remember the name of the loach. I'm like, what is that black and white loach? I don't remember. And then, you know, I saw something shiny and moved on. So great job adding that one to the list. Yeah, I forgot to write down the scientific name, but I'm sure our listeners will only be grateful. <laughs> <laughs> if it was a YouTube video, we'd flash it on the screen, but somebody put in the comment section the scientific name of the panda loach for me, please, would you? Thank you. All right, Charles. All right. So far, you haven't disappointed. This is uh, the perfect segue into the bet I put on my list. Mm. Is it a boring brown one? Nope. Oh, wait. I know what it is. It's... um. Oh, I know what it is. It's, um... Oh, no, Ben! Uh, I promise you guys are wrong because we're spoiled here. No, I I know it. It starts with an S. I know what you guys are thinking of, and it's not that one. It's a different one, not the one you've talked about before. Okay, which one is it? Okay, all right. I put Beta Mahakiensis. Really? Yes, because we're spoiled here. We are spoiled here. It's true. We're spoiled. This is a fish. We're like, what? That one's rare? It is. And it's highly endangered because of humans. Not this, because of aquarium collection. Yeah. It is native to a small region of swamp outside of Bangkok. And this area is already slated for urban development in the next 10 years. <sighs> that means that this will be extinct for sure. In the future. In it's the already wild. planned. It's already going to happen, guys. So the continued existence of this fish is entirely dependent on Aquarius breeders. Now, this one is a frustrating one for me in the like around here because this is one that's actually 
we're lucky because the connections we have, it's actually fairly easy for us to get in. Oh yeah, but no we one have them buys right now, them right? because they're expensive. They're expensive yeah. because they're like we have a source for them, but overall they're still hard to get. Hang on, expensive. Nobody buys them because they're the same price as an equally cool domesticated betta. I don't even want to say expensive because they're the same price right. as the cool domesticated bettas we have right now. Right. Yeah, but these are cooler. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> because they're a wild type that is bright, like, I want to say flaming blue. I don't know why I want to use that, like, terminology. Because it catches you from across the room. Right. And when people are like, oh, he's exaggerating. Dragon scale bettas are a hybrid between domestic strain bettas. And Betamahakiensis. That's where that comes from. The the deep, rich blue that everybody loves. I want a really blue Betta. Mahakiensis is just as blue as the domestic strain Splendens. Maybe even a little shinier blue. And here's the thing that makes it really frustrating for uh-huh. me around here. It's a hard water Betta. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the things that makes it cool. Yes. It loves our water. And mm-hmm. you can keep multiple males together. Yeah, I'll I'll get to that. But I say frustrating because <laughs> the people around here, I'm like, they're like, what's an easy beta to breed? Beta Mahakansas. Like almost no effort. And but, it just gets but, passed over because of price tag. And I'm like, it's right there in front of you. We've bred them without realizing it before. Multiple times. Yeah. We had babies show up. <laughs> like we sold the female and then there was all of a sudden a baby in there a week later. Like. We have Fry in the breeder lab right now, and they were from an accidental breeding. This was not something I was going out to do. It just happened in the retail tank. So betta people who want to have a cool betta on their desk in a small tank with a little filter and a little light and a little heater, you need this fish. Breeder people who want an easy BAP point, you need this fish. Uh, Breeder people who want to maintain a species that's threatened in the wild, you need this fish. Exotic fish keeper that want a fish that's really hard to get and almost no one else has. You need this fish. I just want a pretty fish. You need this fish. What other reason is there? Planted aquarium people who need that perfect accent centerpiece. You need this fish. Yep. What else? Uh, I want to get into wild bettas, but I don't know where to start. My only experience is domestic strain bettas. You need this fish. I want a pair of fish that will breed in my community tank because I can really only have one. You need this fish. <laughs> it's like The list can continue. <laughs> That's the thing. It's one of those fish that I'm like, for me, this ended up on my list because it was the perfect storm of, it should be a holy grail. And it's right there and everyone's ignoring it. It's like that, like the 80s rom-com where you're like, oh, my best friend was my true love the entire time. And I'm like, it's right there. <laughs> <laughs> I like that analogy very much. It's like, I don't know. I don't know. I can keep going on that rant, but that that's no, it's a, it's a good rant. No, I, I love that point, too, because we do have this really biased perspective, especially on this subject, because like I know. So many of the people who've li- been, who've been listening to this podcast have come to us and sent us messages about like, like, I don't have an LFS near me. I don't have any of these stores. Right. I, if you're within fifty miles of us, you're privileged because we will get you this stuff. We, we will. will do it. We will. Yeah. The- yeah. I you know a holy grail list, and I didn't put any Sunda Daniels on it, and mm-hmm. I didn't put any Micro Devarios on it. Did you put it. a note the Bronchius on there? I did. I didn't. <laughs> Right, but it might not be one of the 10 species we regularly get. Yeah. No, it totally is. <laughs> and good. That's, and that's that was, good. I kind of wanted to bring this one yeah. up because that's my point. Like, for most people in the country, this is a hard fish to get. We're just lucky because we have a source. <laughs> yeah. Good point. <laughs> so for everyone that's listening that is not within 50 or 100 miles of uh, Grand Rapids, I have a recommendation for you. Road trip. <laughs> and... We can package bettas for a pretty long trip. Especially a betta. I mean, it's a yeah. it's a, a labyrinth fish. So you know they they can they ship they they travel really well. Bring a bucket and a battery powered airstone, and I think you could, especially if it's a cycled sponge filter at the end. You could drive to L.A. with that fish mm-hmm. in, in your back seat. There you go. Yep. 
That's our challenge. I like it. Come and see us too. We want to meet you. And we'll 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 start up a, a pin on a map for Betamahakiensis. How far have we have those fish traveled? Yeah. That'd Anyone who cool. comes like in it. and mentions the podcast, you can have a free watercolor sticker. <laughs> there we go. I like it. That's a good one. That was a great choice, Charles. I mean, you can drop the microphone and walk out now after that. <laughs> yeah. I was just waiting for the right setup, and Amy, man, she set that one up. Yeah. I set them up, you <laughs> knock them out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. Well, uh, since I let the cat out of the bag that I did include one Nothobronchius. <laughs> I shouldn't have targeted you like that. That's all right. That's all right. Um, choosing the right Nothobronchius was, was tricky. What I decided to do was I thought about the fact that we are spoiled here. Because right now, I think we have four species in stock. Yes. We've had at least four others. Before this place, I don't know that I've seen a Nothobronchus killifish at an aquarium store. Maybe twice. Ever. We have people coming to the state because they can't see them in local fish stores either. I right. will never, ever understand it. Why don't people want to carry them? They're absolutely incredible. They're stupid easy, too. Just about any tank that you keep a domestic strain betta in, you could keep a pair of Nothobronchus killi. And I will put four species at least up against any gorgeous domestic strain betta and say, "Mm, I get how you could argue they're just as pretty but no one could argue that the domestic strain betta is prettier than Eggers eye, Rakovi eye, Cortau's eye, and what's the... Uh, I like Rubipinus. Rubipinus. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Rubipinus. What about Gunther eye, though? I know. He's amazing. But Gunther about- eye is that one that, like, theoretically should not be that cool. And then every time we get him in, I'm like, damn. damn. <laughs> every time. Yeah. Yeah. They're awesome. Um, I, I chose Rakovii as my official holy grail Nothobronchius. But, I, I, you know, I could have even put Nothobronchius Killies as holy grail Killies. Yeah. I honestly thought that your story was going to be that you, like, put a like poster on the wall and you threw a dart at it and that's how you picked <laughs> your species. That- Rakovii seems to be the one that everybody agrees on. Yeah. Yeah. I actually think Eggers eye is a little prettier. I at think Rupert Pinnis is prettier too. But if yeah. anyone says Rakovii, then I'm like, yeah. Rakovii was one of my original Holy Grail attainments. Like I had wanted that fish for a very, very long time. And you know, there was this group of, man, I fucking just get this fish, right? Just get this fish. And they're like five or six fish that if I ever saw, I'm like, wow, if there's any way I could do it, I would do it. And I Rakovii was was one that I got. And I and I I bred that fish. It was very easy to breed. Um, it is a considered a seasonal killifish in the wild they live for Rakovia has one of the shortest lifespan because um, they have one of the longest egg incubation times, which translates to shortest lifespans. So in the wild, Rakovii's are born, grow up, mature, and breed in six months. Oh, and they grow up to almost two inches in length in six months, from zero to two inches. Can you imagine the growing pains? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much they just eat and, well, you know. Um, but they are a dirt spawner. Um, and so... All of you wondering, but wait, I don't want this fish for only six months. Yeah, I kept mine for five years. When it died, it was almost four inches long. Wow. And the color kept getting better. And did it breed that whole time? Like, were they still... I lost the female after three years. And I tried to put another female with it, and he immediately killed it because he was three times the size of any female that was available at that point. Yeah. Um, Like, literally two days later... The female was dead. Um, so I didn't try again after that. So uh, for the first two and a half or three years, like up until he killed the female, yeah, they were, they were breeding Then I constantly. assume that they'd probably be pretty much the whole time. Yeah. 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 Ah, oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Um, and that's the fish that I had a batch of. All right. So really quick 
Northrop Grumman case killie breeding, right? You you get some dirt, you put it in, the, in a container, you put it in the tank. By the way, listen to the other podcasts or the YouTube videos to get more detailed information. This is a summary. Um, and, and, and they breed in the dirt and then you put the dirt in your bag in a bag dried out and you keep it in the bag for the allotted incubation period, which for Nothobronchius rocovii is like six or seven months. I forgot a bag. I missed one. I was tossing bags of killie eggs up in a spot in my closet and keeping them up there for the allotted time and uh, doing the thing. And then the female died and then I tried another female and it didn't work. And I kind of, all right, I cleaned them out and I just kept that. I set it up for just keeping that, maintaining that male by himself, much like you would maintain a, a betta. It was in a fish room that was temperature controlled. He was kept at about 74 degrees, a two and a half gallon tank with nias grass and a light. That was it. There was no substrate. Um, there was no filter, nothing. Nothobronchius is a alternate lung. They are not a labyrinth fish, but they do breathe atmospheric oxygen. They don't need super oxygenated water, but it was really clean. He was eating flake food. He was eating blood worms. He was great. Um, so then I was like, well, you know, I'm not going to breed killies for a while. I should clean out this closet and get all the stuff out there. I had already hatched all the eggs. Lo and behold, a bag fell out. 13 months incubation period. That was like six months longer than what they say the longest should be for that, for those eggs. And I just about threw it away. I thought, you know what? I have a shoe box, a plastic shoe box. Toss it in there, throw some water. Oh, instant fish just had water. Let's see what happens. Three days later, I lost track at 67 fry in that Nothobronchius batch. <laughs> so. If being a holy grail fish is cool, being an easy holy grail fish, right. it's cooler. They are so cool. I ranted. They're fun, but you know, that's kind of what happens here. So yes, Nothobronchius killifish in general, specifically Rakovii. Two and a half gallon tank. They're so easy to keep. They don't take up a lot of space. Thinking about a domestic strain better. Think about a killie instead. Mm -hmm. Great pick. All right. I know Ben has like 10,000 more left, but mm -hmm. I have one left. So I think on my list, this fish is probably the one that I am most, I would be most excited to see in person. I've never seen one before. Mm. Um, I'm not a big live bearer person. But I have always had a bit of a soft spot for sword tails. And I think it's more of I have a soft spot for sword tails because of this fish rather than I have a soft spot for this fish because of sword tails. But I, I get it. The Montezuma sword. I, I'm so glad you brought that fish up. <laughs> I, oh, that's a fish. I just, I've never seen one before and I would love to see it in person. Basically what it boils down to is it's a sword tail Pretty much around the same size as a normal sword tail, a little bit bigger. Bigger. But the sword itself is about six inches long. They're amazing. They're so cool. And I've seen like videos of their displays and how like gracefully they use that sword to flash and show off. And man, that is a cool fish. It's just taking everything cool about that whole group of fish and just elevating up to its just natural coolest form that's a group of wild type fish that is harder and less obtainable for a retail place to get into they're even more specialized than like killies or apistos mm -hmm. it's it's live bear people that are into the wild type swords yeah. um, the xiphophorus genus is 20 or 30 different fish and we have Hellerai, Maculatus and Variatus or some combination of those Yeah. with some speculation that Alvarezai and one other fish are kind of hybridized into those, right? But the, the list I'll call it Maculatus, which is the platy, Variatus, which is the Variatus platy, Maculatus would be the Mickey Mouse platy sometimes, and Hellerai, which is the domestic strain swordtail, mm -hmm. the Montezuma unbelievable fish when you see them in person. Um, ALA yeah. conventions, that would be the conventions of the American Live Bear Association, uh, are the only place that I've ever seen them in the wild. 
yeah, I think we're planning on going to that like triple crown convention next year. I'm hoping that I'll be able to see him there. There's a good chance. Uh, one of our regulars has them right now. Really? Yeah, Dave <gasps> Hammerline has them. Oh, well, of course. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. He keeps threatening <laughs> to bring me some, but he hasn't yet. So Dave, if you're listening, I'm calling you up, my friend. I might even send him a message. I would like to have them oh, here. Oh, do that. He probably would too. He would. <laughs> yeah. He said, he, I'll bring you some. Come on, Dave. That was six months ago. <laughs> Yeah, um, that is this the is a ho- quick aside for that. Probably now is the time to like actually do that because at the next Swamis event, he's bringing me Killies. Oh, oh. so yeah. <laughs> good. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Just letting you know. Yeah, um, that is the Holy Grail sword tail. I mean that to me. Yeah, I mean there are a couple of other contenders. To me, it's the Holy Grail live bearer. And I'm saying that to be controversial on purpose because I know Ben's going to have to think about that for a second. <laughs> I know. Cause, well, there's there's one that's on my alternate list. Yeah. Um, that it, it. Yeah, it is. I can see it. It's definitely the Holy Grail. Um, sword. It's definitely the Holy Grail of the Xiphophorus genus. Although Bertsmanai might be. There are some people that go, no, those Bertsmanai are much cooler. And I get you. I hear you. I'm not arguing. I'm saying, yeah, I hear, uh, you know, but uh, the Montezuma is just, it's it's got that grandeur to it. Yeah. That, from someone coming from sort of yeah. the outside of that world, it's not even a question. Yeah. I, you good people, you, all right, all right, all right. But it's really My hard fish to beat can that. Beat up your fish. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I've seen what Gadeeds can beat up, and it's everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's true. Um, but I have I have one on my alternate list that I haven't decided if I'm going to bring it up or not yet. I, that go if, for it, because I think we're kind of there. Like, I mean, Charles has had one the, more, you have a million more. But my point is, if I had the choice between a Montezuma sword and this one, I would take this one. So I'm saying, for me, there's a different one, but I totally get yeah. the amount that it, it, it well, earned I, I its totally right. get your choice, too. And probably even generally more than my choice. So, yep, I get, totally get. Yeah, that's Let's, all I had to say yeah. about them. I haven't even seen them in person. So what else, What am I going to say? They are a little trickier than some of the domestic strain. They're a little harder to breed. Part of this because they get bigger. Um, you can, with the, the full length of a sword, you can have from tip to sword to tip of nose, you can get close to 10 inches. Yeah, they're they're incredible. And should, but should be relatively basic to do in our water because they do want harder they do yes all of the xiphophorus genus is found in the mountains in mexico yeah. um, at various elevations and that's all um ancient pretty much all ancient coral reef until you get to the western side of mexico um, but that's all going to be hard water calcium carbonate based limestone stuff um and montezuma swords yeah that's can't argue with it great choice <laughs> cool. love it I have one left and I'm sitting here being like, I really want to, like I promised a Cory cat and I really want to sub in something else now. We're getting close to just time for alternates. So maybe chick choose whichever one you want to talk about most and then we'll circle back. Well, okay. you know, what we'll do is, is, and this, this, I think this will work with some of the ones that I have too. We'll do the five and then we'll just like breeze through some alternates. Okay. I got one. Okay. This one is on my list just because I'm like, man, that would be super cool. I've never seen one. I've never even seen one up for sale. I know they exist out there. I know that people can breed them. I know they're easy to breed. I have no idea where they are, though. Better Ferox. Is that the one that you keep saying, if it ever shows up on the list, I want it? I thought there's a different beta on the list that beta... So the Beta Ferox, the thing about it is it's in the Pugnax genus okay. uh, complex. And it's just one of those ones that's really fascinating to me because, like, at least in peninsular Malaysia, the Pugnax genus, why do I keep saying genus? Complex seems to be kind of like a continuum and not like a true break. And the Ferox is, like, right in the middle. See, I think I've seen that before. I've never seen one. I don't know if... I don't know if you'd yeah. know if you had seen it because it, it looks like this. Yeah, it's a boring brown beta. No, it's not boring brown. 
it's it's definitely less color, but it's not like an Edith A. They I didn't see the picture, but I guarantee it's not a good male color. They All actually right, have fine. very thick green operculums. This just looked like a well conditioned, not breeding condition, like it's the IBC picture. Yeah, it's not that great. Yeah. Um, anyways, but I'm f- I'm sorry, a, you know it, we gotta poke at that. <laughs> you can poke at it all you want. You're just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well That's said. what we were looking for. Yep. <laughs> uh, like uh, Horace Linky's book is the book that made me really start appreciating uh, the Pugnax genus because apparently everyone's just terrible at taking photos of them. <laughs> <laughs> but like anyways, it. the Ferox for me is just this weird, like unattainable. I won't even. I don't even have an idea of how to get it. Like at least with Stick Toast, I know how I would get it. Stick Toast. That's the one I was thinking. I just of. Yeah. don't want to pay hundred and fifty dollars more. <laughs> <laughs> right. But like Ferox, I have no idea what the logistics would be. I don't like. But people are breeding them. I just don't know who and where. <laughs> so, like, where are they from? Is it difficult to collect them? No, they're just from the middle of Peninsular Malaysia. Hmm. Like, if you go all the way from, like, Thailand down to the peninsula, like, the entire, uh, there's, like, four Pugnax complex species. And the genetic evidence seems to indicate that they're just, they're not really, like, a true delineation. It's just, you get at one end of the spectrum, and it's very clearly one thing. And you the other end, and it's very clearly a different thing. But there's this middle zone that's kind of like, what is it? Ferox is right in the middle, and that's why I'm like, I want that fish. Because right. what what's the deal there? Uh-huh, uh-huh, <laughs> uh-huh. And it just seems, I don't know, it's cool. It just speaks to the genetist, like the geneticist in me that's like, what is that? I want to pick it apart. That looks cool. Yeah. So yeah. one of your holy grail bettas is the geekiest betta. Yeah. Yeah. Just that- like... That tracks. That's I mean, fair. You know, uh, yeah, heck yeah. That's part of what makes something holy grail is just yeah. like, what are those little oddities about it? Yeah. Anyways, that's it's like, that's all I can say about it. It's yeah. like it's weird. I don't know where to get it. <laughs> it's a fish that if you could get your hands on would be pretty easy to keep. Yeah. Malay Peninsula it wouldn't be too soft of water. No. The from what I've been told, they breed like literally in anything. <laughs> because they're a Pugnax complex beta and so they're just they're just not they don't care that's a mouth breeder right yeah 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 and Pugnax are like the energizer bunny <laughs> yeah right so anyways I don't know I want it it's cool alright I'll add that to my list to ask about the wholesaler cause <laughs> like that's that might be one that just nobody is interested in collecting cause people might not know they want it yet have you asked about Sictos before I've never asked about it, no. That's another one on your like Yeah. That's the yeah. that's the one that got away. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we should have some good sway with that wholesaler. I'm gonna have to start pushing back a little bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Buy a lot of fish from those guys. We do. I think that's a good plan. <laughs> All right. What do you want to finish off your official list on? So ben? you know, I think I'm I think I'm gonna finish off with a uh kind of a good like uh curveball. Okay. So what makes a holy grail fish? It's Got harder it. to keep. <laughs> harder to find. It's expensive. Lots of people want them, but not everybody goes for it. Mm. Mm. This one actually isn't hard to find. That doesn't help me. Many places carry them. Not every place. I don't think the big box stores do. But lots of places have one tank of them. Are you talking about discus? I'm talking about discus. <laughs> wow. My, that did not even enter my brain. Yeah. It's a, it's I, considered the king of freshwater fish. It's the holy grail because you need to work up to it, not necessarily because you can't find it. Right. Yeah. You got to work up to it. It's expert level, but it's attainable. It's ex- there's no such thing as a cheap discus. Right? Or there shouldn't be. Right. Right. Cheap discus is a dead discus. That's a good point. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So yeah, I debated as to whether or not I was going to put put it on the list and and part of the reason I came up with alternates is because I'm like, wow, I should put discus on the list. All right, I'm not sure I want to put discus on the but they they have earned their place as a holy grail fish. I did really heavily consider putting the one of the wild species of discus on there. I thought about going that route as well. And I thought, you know what? 
the wild species are only a little harder to keep. Mm-hmm. We see the wild species on the list pretty regularly. They're not any more expensive than the domestic strains. And some of those domestic strains are, man, you look at, all right, I'm doing another shout out to Jeff Sensky with uh, the Cram Design Group. Look at some of the discus tanks that they do. Um, they're incredible. Yeah, but my favorite discus tank of theirs is the one with the wild ones. <laughs> it's <laughs> Wild discus uh, are absolutely no, incredible. The reason I didn't put them was because I thought it would be well covered by everything we had to say about Ultim Angels. Yeah. It's that's true, and I think wild discus are, but this is the one domestic strain yeah. that I'm I'm putting on it, and I'm sticking to it. Um, yeah, the number of people who come in here and are like, "Oh, someday." Exactly. Yeah. Yes, that's why I thought discus needed to be on, needed to be on the list. Um, you know, we kind of went through some of the care and some of the difficulties with some of these fish, so I'll just breeze over that with discus. You got to keep them hot. 80 is too cold. 85 to 90 is where they want to be. 90 is not too hot for discus. You do a discus tank. You don't do a community tank with discus in it. Yeah, this is where I'm going to plug the caveat I give to a lot of customers that ask me about discus. I tell people, don't set up a discus tank because you want something pretty. If you want something pretty, set up a reef tank. Because it'll cost you about the same and probably be less work. And you'll have more options. Yeah. Set up a discus tank because you want discus. Because that fish deserves that treatment. It does. Uh, To me, a a planted tank with plants that can tolerate hot temperatures. Amazon swords, by the way. look. Amazon swords and foul. Like, that's just a home run. That's home run. Yep. Don't make it complex. Don't add CO2. I know some people have done CO2 discus tanks. I'd the the CO two and oxygen um, dissolve rate in a hot in hot water is just it's hard. If you put your hands up on the side of our discus tank, it feels warm to the touch even on a hot summer day. Discus need to be hot. Some uh, really nice branching driftwood. Yes, yeah, and you don't have to keep only discus. There are some tank mate possibilities, but they need to complement the discus. And to me, a pair of uh, many options, uh, a pair of many of the different dwarf cichlid species that are available. We've kept um, um, apistos with them. We've kept rams with them. We've kept um, nanochromus with them. I, the nanochromus to me was my favorite combination. Mm-hmm. That was fantastic. Yeah, that was perfect. So, If you want a cori cat, um, I tell people Corydoras sturbe. That's Sturbes, like one of the yeah. few true warm water cori yeah. cats. <laughs> a traditional fish with discus is cardinal tetras and i know it works sometimes when we tried it we watched them eat eight cardinal tetras before we could get them out so the thing i believe it works but i don't believe it works without them eating some of them i think you're probably right (laughs) it's their natural prey it's like literally the thing that they eat in the wild that body (laughs) is designed to get into the what work of a flooded amazon river basin Get at little fish. <laughs> yeah. Catch cardinal tetras. Yeah, it's true. But yeah, discus, um, that, that is a, a holy grail. Some, I would say many people would say it might be the holy grail of holy grails. Yeah. Not for me, uh, but it, it, has, it has earned that position. Well, and it's earned it, but I don't know that it, like, it definitely needs to be treated as a separate type of tank. But mm-hmm. doing discus is way more attainable than so many people think. True. Like, they have that, the people who do discus, a lot of the times, they're doing bare bottom so they can keep things as clean as possible. They're keeping 20 discus in a 75-gallon tank. They're doing 50% water changes every day, every other day. Like, okay, yes, that. Or... Same 75-gallon tank, tons of plants, and a pair, maybe five, and do normal water changes. Do yeah. normal, fairly big water changes. And keep them hot. And keep them hot. Keep them hot. But, yeah, sure, jam as many discus as possible, but then you got to feed that many discus and you got to clean up after them. Right. Keep it reasonable, do it slow, just like any other tank, and it becomes just like any other tank. Yep. Completely agree. Had to put them on the list. I think they belong there. That was a that was a good one to end the official picks on. Those are the official picks, everybody. 
hopefully uh, we covered some of the fish that you would consider holy grail fish. But I know we all had some fish like, ah, this should be on this list, but I want this on this list more. So um, let's do this a little bit rapid fire. But um, what, like, Amy, two of your alternates. Yeah, I don't have a ton of alternates, but I definitely thought about putting the butterfly barb on there. Oh, yeah. Um, Cute. And even to a lesser extent, the fire barbs, just because I know people don't order them. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, nanofish, I've talked about them before, but the ornate glass tetra, oh, I think, yeah. is definitely up there on the peak of those. The Cory cat that you texted me about oh. over the weekend, I I did not I put it on the it list because called, I totally even. thought you were going to. No, I didn't just because I, I don't even really know that fish. I think it was CW47. Let me see. It was a, a quarry cat that would be $150 quarry cat. And when you look at the pictures, it's almost like a Royal Zebra Pleco paint job on a quarry cat with yeah. an orange stripe. It was ridiculous. They would have been $150. Yeah. They were super cool. Yep. Well, my Rapid cor- fire. My quarry cat would have been uh, Corridor Sadolfi. I'm still stuck on that 90s. Like, that's the Holy Grail quarry cat. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm still stuck. Yeah. To me, it's a common one, but I got to remind myself, we're spoiled here. We're yeah. spoiled. Um, yeah. The Orange Laser or the Corridorus Equis are both other ones that I've right. seen at the top of people's lists. And right. those are all pretty easy to keep. They're just quarry cats with weird paint jobs. Yeah. 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 Um, my other alternate I would have thrown in was uh, Dickensia assimilis, the oh, mascara barb. Yeah. I thought about that as being that a holy a really grail barb. That was a really good one. Yeah. yeah. Even denizens would I make even a good holy grail. That too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a traditional holy grail fish. Like walk into right. a store. Ooh, look at those. I don't disagree yeah. with that, but it, like if you had mature Dickensia assimilis. Oh, yeah. Like. A lot of people won't even know what that is. Yeah. No. <laughs> and those yeah. things look ridiculous. Yeah. And that probably goes for all Dawkinsia, but that one particularly. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. The mascara bar, it's called that because it looks like it has mascara, but it also looks like, like when the ma- males are mature, the red. Which is really contrasted by the, they have a true like cream belly. Yeah. Like what yeah. in the world? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, some of my alternates, um, leopard frog pleco. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't include it because the Royal Zebra is the Holy Grail Pleco, um, uh, the Clouded Archer. Yeah, I did think about that one. But it's... See, now we're getting back to it again. It's not really rare to me anymore. I know, but it's but it it's is. really rare. And yeah, it's an and it's attainable... it's a freshwater archer. That doesn't get 12 inches long. Yeah. Doesn't get big enough to eat. The other arches, by the way, they're really cool. They get big enough to eat. Um, Telegram of Bishardi, mm-hmm. which is a really cool West African goby cichlid. Um, the Episto... Uh, by the way... We're deep enough into the podcast now that I can say that both of those should be coming next week. Sweet. For the rare fish auction. Sweet. <laughs> Excellent. Because this that will have already happened by the time this yeah. podcast comes out. Perfect. <laughs> um, I, I, with the pistos, I was torn between putting Elizabethae on and Winklefleck. Oh, I was Winkle torn Fleck. between uh, Elizabethae and the one that I actually talked about. Nice. <laughs> I was actually thinking abacashi because it's one that also comes from one of those little nubs of the river that they're really difficult to get to. Winklefleck is the only one that has those weird vertical bars on yeah, it. Yeah, that's cool. And that cool. kind of made it, you know, stand out. Um, Atabapo red pike cichlids. Oh, yeah. Yep. They are incredible. That We're talking 180 gallon plus tank with mm-hmm. Atabapo red pike cichlids. Um, Crenicicla zebrina the zebra pike that's a six or eight inch pike cichlid that that's sounds cool. just funky it's like a rainbow zebra painted pike cichlid um and then we touched on my holy grail live bear um there's a teeny tiny little live bear from Colombia. it's actually smaller than any fish native to north america whoa i just looked up that zebra pike yeah they're pretty killer aren't they wow our wholesaler has had them it's like basically the um the compressor steps that we've got but like huge and amazing yeah, right? Let me see that picture. It's, I just had the whole Google images up. Oh, yeah. Google yeah. Google Conocicla zebrina Whew. or zebra pike cichlid, and you'll, you'll find it too. Um, but my tiny little live bird, Neo Hatterandria elegans. That is uh, not just a holy grail, but a nemesis. I've had it twice. Um, I bred them. I got babies. I turned them in. I got my BAP points. I actually bought the babies back at the auction. And I could not get generation two out of them. 
Yeah, if you're a nanofish person, they should be on your holy grail list too. They're amazing. So should um, the glass goby and the dragon micro goby. Right. Um, I thought about putting the Australian desert goby. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought about putting Tecano tetras. We actually talked about putting Tecano tetras. Yeah. Um, some of the other Hephaestobrycons that are coming out of sure. South America the right now. The lapis that we've got right now should be on people's lists. They're amazing. Uh, if I were going to pick a better, it would have been Alba Marginata, I think is probably a holy grail oh, for a lot of people. That's like a miniature macrostoma. Yeah, the little mini mouth way. brooder. Or the chinoides yeah. too, but I like Alba Marginata better right. for some reason. Uh, right. Me too. I don't, I don't know, know why. why. It's like a personality thing for me. I don't know. They are definitely more outgoing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was catching... We're, we're on tangents now. That's I was, right. I was catching neon tetras in the tank that held, had the albies today, and they were just sitting there like i caught them probably 10 times because they didn't even care they're like i'm a leaf don't eat me i don't want to eat you i just want you out of my way <laughs> i almost put my inlay lake daniels on there oh yeah but i've had them for 12 years so it doesn't feel like a holy grail fish yeah um but it should be that's a fish that should be in the hobby it should be huge should be popular mm-hmm. very hard to find yeah i'll admit when we first pitched this podcast i wasn't 100 percent on board but i'm really glad we did only because Trying to think my way through this list made me really appreciate where we are. Right. <laughs> right. Oh, we do get spoiled, guys. We do get some pretty <sighs> amazing exposure to some really unique fish. And pretty consistently. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like as a as a as a goal, as a philosophy. We <laughs> Dude, we get bored so easy here. And so we <laughs> always need something interesting to do. It's true. Oh, um, another honorable mention, the soda cichlids. Oh, right. That's I, a perfect holy grail fish. Is. Yeah. Um, yep. Because when are you ever going to see those? I did find out that our, I mean, I don't think they're being collected out of their native range anymore, but our wholesaler is getting them from a local breeder around where they are. So perfect. We're, perfect. we're a little privileged on those ones. Perfect. We have some right now. Mm. I know. They're really cool. <laughs> I like they're it. They're gorgeous, too. They just yeah, once keep they getting mature, prettier. Geez. Have we ever uh, made a shout out to the lady that came in and had a soda cichlid tattoo on? Because if we <laughs> haven't, I really want to call her out Yeah, quick. yeah that's, that's a cool call out. Just because yeah. she, like, she came in, we had soda cichlids, and she was just completely flabbergasted. She li- just I heard... think maybe that's a good way. Uh, maybe we need to like cut this back and go but that's probably a good way to end because this is like the peak of the holy grail fish concept oh man that to me it, there's nothing better than somebody walking in going ah oh, there's this fish i had or this fish i've seen someday i hope to find it and us going oh yeah we have some of those yeah I guess this lady almost cried she, tears 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> she Apparently had a group of them like five years ago. They were like one of her favorite things. She has a tattoo of them on her arm and not just like, oh, she has a soda cichlid. No, she has a group of soda cichlids and she could point to individual ones and go like, this one is holding eggs and this one is blah, blah. Like almost wow. half sleeve of her colony yeah. of soda cichlids. Wow. And so she came in and she was just like completely flabbergasted that we just we just had them. And... um. She was so stunned that her husband immediately stepped in, knew that she couldn't handle how excited she was, and he was taking notes for her on how we were keeping them in the store because they wanted to perfectly replicate a tank at home as soon as they got home so they could come and get them. And, like, just the... I, A, really appreciated him just because he immediately knew what he needed to do for his wife in that situation, and it was... Beautiful to watch, by the way. But just to watch her be like, oh my God, I get to have him again. Like, I guess she lost him because I think because of a power outage, like something completely out of control. Attaining a holy grail fish is one of those things that makes everybody happy and that makes me incredibly happy when we get that opportunity. But that story makes me happier than I would be getting Ultim Angels. I love that. Mm-hmm. That's why that's why I keep doing this is because of stories like that. Yeah. Like yep. you're in a hobby because you want to share it with other people. Yeah. And the aquarium hobby attracts like some of the most like rabidly passionate people that you can imagine. Mm-hmm. People like that who just love something so much that just 
seeing it and knowing someone else knows it exists makes you cry. <laughs> like, <laughs> how crazy is that? Yep. Oh, I that's pretty it. amazing. It's great. Well, the concept of the Holy Grail fish is, it's a little bit of a scary concept because it's that wanting the unattainable. It's wanting that, that, that thing that you can't have and that can drive people to do stupid things and that can drive people to do bad things. It can also drive people to do good things. Most of the time, what's happening in the hobby with a lot of these holy grail fish, they're expensive because they're hard to get or they're rare. Mm-hmm. We, we touched on sustainability. Paying and the price. Paying the price. And that, that sustainable collection of some of these fish is... Um, that part is so important. That part is so necessary, not only to preserve those habitats, but also notice I didn't say leave them. I said sustainable collection. If we can sustainably collect those fish, those really rare, really expensive ones, and those people collecting those fish can make an income protecting that habit, have a reason to protect that habitat. We can keep those fish in the wild and we can have those fish in our tanks and we get to appreciate those holy grail fish. And here's something, here's how I'm going to rephrase that just a little bit. When you cheap out on these fish, you are far more likely to be dealing with something who is skirting the rules. Mm-hmm. And skirting the rules here means poaching. Right. Or collecting when they're not supposed to be or not following the regulations that they should be. It's just such yeah. a hard conversation for me to have with people. They're like, why is this... X amount here and Y amount there. And like, it's hard for me to just be like, yeah, it's, there's probably a reason. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but that's the reality. The, the, um, Roseline sharks, that's the, that's the, the poster child for that. Mm-hmm. If you're paying a little extra for a Roseline shark for a Denitsone barb, other name for that fish, it's probably a tank raised fish. If it's a wild caught fish, it's poached in a habitat that's being destroyed partially by the aquarium hobby not completely but partially by the aquarium hobby yeah so, all of you that are so irritated at us right now for not having pea puffers same thing same thing yep that's why we have pea puffers they're tiny because they're tank bred yeah, Captain and why bred, we haven't raised. had them for two months yeah we're completely yeah. at the mercy of people breeding them breeding them successfully so holy grail fish let us help you find it breed it and maintain those populations. Please. That I think and is a good... bring it back. Uh, yeah. A good takeaway for the, the fish clubs, right? The BAPs. Have your six, seven, eight, ten tanks that you're trying to get those BAP points. Have one or two species maintenance tanks. Tanks that you're saying, I'm going to keep, I'm going to breed, and I'm going to distribute this fish as much and as long as I can for the next 10 years. Even if it's just a white cloud. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we've talked way too much tonight. I want to know what your holy grail fish are. What are the ones we missed? Yeah, please leave a comment. Send an email to podcast at watercoloursaquariumgallery.com. Um, find us on Facebook. We do have a group out there for our listeners. It's the Watercolors Aquarium Gallery podcast listeners because super creative. <laughs> um, and just keep in touch however you can. We love to hear everything we can from you guys and um send us a picture of your holy grail fish too if you already have it i love it thank you so much for listening let's have lots of fun and keep those hands wet